Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. Uh, yesterday on Twitter, I asked a couple of people if there was any questions they had. Thought of trying out this new sort of Q and A type feature, where uh, you pose your questions and I give you some answers. So hopefully, I can shed some light on some of the things that have been bothering you, and maybe you know share some something that I might be able to help with um, understanding things better. So. I got a couple of questions, uh, about 10 or 11 questions uh, from you guys, and I'll answer them now. So, yeah, here we go. Question one comes from Jack Darby. It says, what chance do you give the All Blacks of winning one of the games against South Africa? Uh, well, Jack, it's a very interesting question. I've never really seen a bad All Black side. I know they're not doing the greatest at the moment, but I think you've got to realise they're coming here with a, having taken a lot of flack back home having been uh, taken, been the brunt of a lot of abuse by fans, media, everything, and they're going to be hurting. I think they're a lot better team than we give them credit for a lot of the times. Um, you know, they are a team that can score out of nothing. They are a team that still doesn't go bad overnight. They've got some coaching problems, but, you know, they're going to come here hurting. I think back to when the box lost in 2017 to the All Blacks 57-0 and came back two weeks later and, you know, lost by a single point. And, you know, that sort of hurt drives the team, it drives the passion in the team and they're going to be, especially in that first game in the Elspreet, uh, a very tough team to beat. I think the Springboks, the other problem is I don't think the Springboks have been at their best in this this time uh, against Wales. I think uh, Wales are the type of team that upset the box rhythm and I don't think they're hitting their straps yet. So there's a lot for the box to work on. I know they've been saying that for quite a while and sort of trying to downplay expectations, uh, but you know, um, the Springboks have to play a lot better than they played against Wales, against uh, New Zealand. We saw, the worry for me is that we saw in that first test against Ireland, um, yeah, that uh, two drop balls and two tries. Box dropped a lot of balls in that, in, in that test series against Wales and they weren't punished for it. New Zealand are the type of side that can punish you for that. Saying that, the box forwards are, I think, better than the Irish forwards. I think uh, the Irish forwards played with a discipline uh, that we haven't seen for a long time in international teams against New Zealand. And they didn't allow New Zealand to play. And we, we tend to smother New Zealand, try and smother them as well. So if the box forwards get on top, I'd say the box will win on both tests. Um, but yeah, that first one in the L spread, I think is going to be crucial. If there's one, the All Blacks will win. I think it will probably be that one. Uh, I can see them winning a game. I'm hoping it doesn't happen from a South African point of view. But um, I reckon it can happen. Um, the, the key to me is how the box play in those games. Okay, second question from Peter Kralung. What's the reason for the new communication between prop and hooker at the lineouts? Peter, I think what you're probably referring to is that what we can see the, the, the props whispering in the hooker's ears at the lineouts. I don't think it's really anything new, to be very honest. I think in international rugby, you try and get any sort of advantage that you try and can get. And I think teams have got so adept at studying each other's lineouts at the moment that they look for signals and they look for little quirks that players have and they look for things that they do. So the the, the least amount of time that you can give them that, uh, the better. And so to me, you know, to see a team do that, they what happens late is teams, the trend tends to be to delay the line out as long as possible and then you know, get the signal as, and the hooker goes to obviously try and not waste time. Hooker goes and gets the ball and the team comes in and then they give the signal like that. So I think it's really just more a tactic to try and try and put your opposition off because teams have got so adept at, at studying each other's line outs now. Um, so I think that's all it really is. I don't think it's that new. I think it's uh, it's, it's sometimes a bit irritating, I'm not going to lie. Um, sometimes teams yeah, and refs need to police that a bit better. But uh, yeah, I don't see, there's nothing really wrong with it, I suppose. But yeah, um, I think that's the reason for it. Next question comes from Quirk. It says, do you think the All Blacks dropped the continuity ball after McCall, Reed, and Hanson all exited the change room? They've always had strong captains. And who's the right player to lead them now? Sure, that's a difficult one because you know what we haven't really watched Super Rugby that closely as as we used to watch it as well. I don't think Sam Kane's a bad player. I think he's maybe not the right player at the right time to lead the All Blacks. I probably would have thought Sam Whitelock might might have led them more. Um, I don't know. He would be my choice for captain. That said, they did keep uh, continuity when when they uh, kept Ian Foster there. And sometimes teams do need a change, so you do need a change of management and. And things coming through that previous Steve Hansen, 
you know, Graham Henry era was was one that sort of went through for a while. So maybe a change was necessary. Whether we, Ian Foster was the right guy at that stage, you know, I still don't know what Razor needs to do to get to that job. But um, yeah, that's what they chose, and now they're under pressure now. So it'd be interesting. I don't think there's too much. I think they've got some ex- excellent players there, and the team doesn't consist anymore of just one captain. I think it consists of a, a captaincy group, a senior leaders group, which normally takes the team through. So I think that's more where you look at, at the leaders of the different parts of the team and how they function together. I think that's much more than the captain really does the media interviews and, and you know, talks to the ref. But the rest of the time, I think you know, that leadership group is the one that leads the team through. So maybe that's what, what should be looked at. It comes from Villa Marais. It says, Brendan, Evan Ruiz was by far the best player in the URC. Ninaba then plays him in a losing side that never had any chance of winning. How does he specifically recover from here? Suddenly Low is the go-to man and Ruiz is nowhere to be seen. Makes me think of Khafi Dutwe. <laughs> Willem, um, yeah, I must admit, I'm going to say I'm going to disagree with you there. I don't think that, first of all, I don't think that side had a chance, had never had a chance of winning. They were leading for 78 minutes. Um, in fact, if they were a bit more clinical on, on attack, they probably would have won that game quite well. I think Wells never really threw a punch. They hung in there. And just, yeah, the, if you think of how many chances the box spilled in that second test, yeah, they should have won that one by quite far. So I don't think that, that's the first point. The second point, I think, is is you must understand what a team, how the team dynamic works. You're not going to just walk in as a young player and just dethrone players who've won the World Cup and won a Lions series. You're going to have to earn your place there. You've got to earn the jersey and you've got to take it away from somebody. And I think Evan Ross had a superb URC season. I think, well, though, he's more seen as a number eight than a, a, a blindside flank. And I think that's probably where Elric Lowe comes in a bit more on the bench, is he's seen more as a bench option, uh, more sort of blindside flank. He does a lot more work around, around you know, the, 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 the unseen places for the box. Um, so I think that's the thing where I think Ruiz is probably more uh, more in your face, go to flashy player. I think it's just the way the box play at the moment that that's, that's like that. I see. Yeah, Jasper Visser had an excellent season on his own at Leicester. So I don't think the selection was wrong because he was one of the premiership players and he was in the system before. So Ross is going to earn his place. I think his time will come. I don't think we're going to see, going to keep him out of that side for too much longer. And I think uh, Evan Ross is, is going to be somebody who's going to play Springbok rugby if he carries on this trajectory for a long time to come. So I don't think he, uh, he's he's done anything wrong. I think he must also realise the box also have a Quacha Smith who's who's done nothing wrong and was actually quite did quite superbly in the Welsh series as well. So I think uh, I think we should try and move away from the the whole thing of you know this, this the, the flavour of the month that we see a player perform well in URC and he must be included otherwise. I think the box coaches have deserved have earned the right to um, select who they feel is right. I think they've won a World Cup, they won a Lions series, and they obviously know what they're doing. So while you and I might disagree on team selections, or we might disagree with them on team selections, I think uh, there is a plan for each player. I think there is a plan for Evan Ruiz, and and I think there's a plan for Elric Lowe, and I don't think it's one or the other. I think at the end of the day, you want to get the best out of the 23 on the field and the others that are backing them up. So that's the thing. So sorry to disagree, but that's the way I see it. I uh, hope you understand. It comes from William Mabote. I hope I said that right, William. Uh, morning, Brendan. Uh, who do you see winning the rugby championship? Sure, that's a tough one, because uh, I don't think we've seen the teams in action yet. I'd, I'd say with the draw, um, the Springboks have got to be a pretty decent favourites for... Well, decent chance to win the world uh, the rugby championship. I think if they can win the two games against the All Blacks here, um, that'll give them a firm start. It's the first time they're starting at home for a long time. Normally they have to travel before they play at home, so that's a, a big advantage for for the box. I think the big thing for them is they're going to have to win in Australia. They haven't won there since 2013. Saying that, they haven't beat the All Blacks in South Africa since 2014. So those are both milestones they're going to have to overcome if they're going to want to win. Um, Australia are a tough side. I don't see them being that good, though, although they tend to win against the box, even though the box dominate them in Australia every single year. Um, they find ways of winning. They, yeah, Argentina, I think, will cause problems in Argentina for most sides, but uh, 
I don't see them beating the All Blacks in New Zealand, to be very honest. So, uh, to me, to me, to, uh, what I would say is that you're probably going to see, uh, you, you're probably going to see the, the the winner of the Springbok All Blacks game is going to be the key to winning the rugby championship. And if the box can do that, I'd back them to go all the way and win the rugby championship. Then, um, but it's, look, it's going to be tough. It's, it's these games are you know, decided by razor thin margins at the end of the day. So. Um, I don't think we should uh, count all our chickens, should I say. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next couple of weeks between the box and the All Blacks. Johan Ru says, if you had to give the current Springboks fitness level a mark out of 10, what would you score them? <laughs> Johan, I think I'm the last person you should ask about fitness. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, seriously, sorry, I don't mean to laugh about that, but I don't think I'm, I'm really qualified to talk about fitness. I can talk from an outsider's point of view, of course, but I think there are a lot more qualified people to talk about that than me. Uh, but uh, Johan, uh, to be honest, I think they finished well, strongly in that first test against Wales. I think if they had the, a more experienced bench in the second test against Wales, they would do, do well. Um, they would have won that game. And I think they finished strongly in the third test as well. So I, I'm not sure they, fitness is actually a problem there. I, I think what we must also realize is just that workload is probably more a thing you should look at because the, these rugby players have been playing nonstop for two years. They haven't really had an off-season in the last two years. And, you know, they've gone through all sorts of things in the last two years with COVID and bio-bubbles and things like that. So, um, yeah, to me, um, as I say, I, I'm not sure there is a problem with fitness, but um, I'm hoping that answers your question because, yeah, as I say, there's probably a lot more people who are a lot more qualified than me to answer that one. Okay, next question is from Damon Calvari who asks, has All Black standard of play gone down or other, have other teams just elevated their standard? Damon, I think there's probably two, it's a bit of both to be very honest. I think... We've got to give credit for the way the Northern Hemisphere teams have become more professional. They've been influenced um, by Southern Hemisphere coaching as well. They've taken the best of both and put it together, and they've become extremely professional. So um, I think we've seen it in the URC. We've seen it in the Premiership. We've seen the French top 14. There's there's a lot of money being spent up north, and there's and they're getting value for money. So I think those players are, are – Southern Hemisphere teams are no longer foreign to them. They know what to expect. And they and they evolving, so we've got, we've got to evolve along with them. I think what has hap also happened is that the absence of South African teams in the uh, in the in Super Rugby Pacific um, has probably affected them a bit more. There's no more the abrasive um, physicality that they'd be used to on a weekly basis, and uh, you know, over time that takes a toll. And I think it's going to take a toll in New Zealand rugby long term. Saying that, I don't think New Zealand rugby is ever going to be. Uh, a weaker rugby nation. I won't say ever see use the word weak for them because I've got a lot of respect for them and they've got some fabulous players. But um, they they might struggle here and there, but they'll they'll rectify that pretty quickly. And that's why you're already seeing moves to play an SAA team against a New Zealand A team. You're seeing moves to have an under twenty team come to a year as well um, to South Africa at some point late in the year. You, you, you're seeing all those sort of things happen. So um, yeah, they they. They are aware of it, and I think they're missing the physicality. But they, you, you'll be very see. They'll make they'll make some moves very quickly to try and rectify that. Okay, next question comes from Box and Ball. Uh, do you expect Jaden or Fuff to start? Uh, oh, that's a difficult one. Well, I would expect Fuff to start. I'd expect the Box to go with their most experienced team. I think Jaden did well, and I think Jaden will probably be on the bench. If anything, I think the one thing we haven't. We sort of realized this Herschel Young, he's just moved out of the 23 now. Jaden saw the guard and gone past him. So to me, uh, if I was the selectors, I'd probably start with Fife just because he gives that extra bit. But and but I think a message was sent out to him in that final Welsh test, and I expect him to respond as well. So I'd say uh, Fife would start. Next question comes from Dirk Kruger, who says, I'm quite interested to hear your take on the argument that the brand of rugby played in Super Rugby Pacific is not allowing a sufficient platform to breed forwards that can handle what the box and the likes of France and Ireland will bring to the trenches. Dirk, um, I think I've answered this a little bit, it's basically the same question a bit earlier, very similar to that. Uh, I think, yes, they are suffering because not having um, you know, South African teams in Super Rugby. I think we, we added something very different. Uh, there's a bit of more expansive play in, in, in Southern Hemisphere rugby and 
but we've always brought a sort of physical challenge to it, which is maybe not there all the time at the moment, or, or maybe very different to what it is at the moment. So, to be honest with you, I think it has it has affected their play. It has affected their their competition as well, and and they probably yeah you know, you, you've seen higher scoring games they um, good rugby. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's bad rugby. I think, but I think the the real beneficiaries have probably been the Irish teams who have probably you know sort of finally found the sort of physical challenge they've needed you know to up their game as well. So I think that probably has a little bit to do with it. They don't want to take anything away from the, their coaching structures. But I think that probably has a little bit of to do, to do with it as well. And I think as things go on, you'll see New Zealand will adapt and they'll 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 find a way of doing it. They'll have to if they want to stay in the top top two in the world. And and with their ambition, their passion for rugby, I'm sure they're already making plans to do that. Okay, next one. Um, this one comes from GSGL. Uh, if SA Talent continues to move overseas early in their career. Thank you, Harida. Uh, how will this drain affect the national team? Will domestic rugby suffer? Um, to be honest, I don't think it's going to. I think we're going to see uh, quite the opposite. We're going to see a lot more players coming back to South Africa. I think, look, we will, you're never going to get past the rand and the effect of the currency. <laughs> anyway, you're never going to get past the effect of the currency, but but I think what we are seeing is there's already uh, talking. In, uh, of the GIF system in France, we have to play more every year. There's a, the quota goes up that you have to play more and more um, French-based players, f- French qualified players, and the same is going to happen in England. They're going to reduce the number of foreign players in the next couple of years, so those contracts are going to get less and less. And what you're going to see is going to be less place for overseas uh, contracts for players. You're still going to lose players here and there, and Japan's still the market that is the big worry for everybody. Um, because they've got big money and, and they, their seasons aren't as taxing. Um, so so you might see players still go through to Japan. You might see a lot more of these sabbaticals uh, that players seem to take to Japan, like the Kanye Am did earlier this year. Uh, but I think you're going to probably see a lot more players coming home, a lot more of those sort of fringe players uh, you know, come, come back to South Africa, and, and that can only increase you know, competition. Yeah, So I think we're going to need bigger squads playing in the European Cup and playing in URC, and if there's still going to be a Curry Cup as well, yeah, the, you're going to need bigger squads, so you're going to need a lot more depth. One thing is, there is depth, but yeah, you need experience with that depth. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot more of those players coming back to South Africa at some point. Okay, next question is from Alyssa. Alyssa Stone says, "This the Rossi video clearly upset a lot of people in Europe. Do you think it could have a commercial effect on South African franchises in the long term in terms of brand building and fan, fan engagement? It feels like the SA brand took a knock and we are, we are now perceived as sore losers and a bunch of whiners. Um, yes and no. This, I, think, I think one thing, maybe the Springbok brand took it a little bit. I think uh, the rugby that the Stormers and the Bulls and, and the Sharks played in Super Rugby, um, URC, sorry, um, probably negated that too a bit, and I think people have moved on a bit as well. Uh, I think we might have taken a knock is in the in the halls of you know, the, the those old men who run world rugby. I think we're not the most loved people around there, and it's understandable. Uh, I understand why Rossi did what he did. I I, I, th- I felt the outcry was a bit overboard, um, and yeah, I think yeah, you know, I have no qualms with why the video was made or you know who was right and who was wrong. I think World Rugby showed itself up quite a bit in the process as well, you know, by just accepting um, one side of the argument and not accepting the counter arguments as well. And I think, you know, we can have a whole debate about the Rossi video at the end of the day, but I think the bottom line is it upset a lot of people. It, It took a lot of World Rugby officials out of their comfort zone. And I think, if anything, I don't think it's so much fans, because fans adapt. And the Springbok rugby plays good rugby and, and local teams play good rugby. I think their brands will stand on its own. I think what will more happen is that you probably will go to watch for a backlash from officials and things like that. You know, little subtle ones that come around. But uh, hopefully everyone's adult enough to move on. Um, we hope so. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to really play that much of a part. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Next question. From Sean Tollich says, with the top four on the, on the same side of the World Cup draw, does it open a path for England to win? 
Sean, yes, it does. It does. Uh, England's probably got the easiest draw of everybody. I mean, they don't play any of the top four sides until they get probably to the final. Uh, yeah, they, they've got Australia on their side of the draw. That's probably their biggest threat. So, um, yeah, they do have a much easier path. Um, and they do know the conditions well. So I'd, I'd say, yeah, if anybody's favoured next year, it's, it's, it's England. they pro- probable finalists. I can't see anybody really beating them. Um, and I think they've got the team to make it to the final. Have they got the team to win the final? I suppose it depends how much attrition there is in those, in those pool games and the quarterfinal, semifinals from the other side of the draw. It's going to be a hell of a tough other side of the draw. But, you know, there is, a, I suppose, an argument of a battle-hardened team. It might be one game too far for them, though, but I think England have got an exceptional chance. And they're going to thank World Rugby for that, for this ridiculous thing of making the draw three years out from the World Cup. Uh, I think nobody agrees with that other than probably England. But then again, just the point, who's running World Rugby? Who's the president of World Rugby, the chairman of World Rugby? Bill Beaumont. So where does he hail from? Where was his previous post? Or if you... It's a total coincidence, of course. Um, but yeah, I just uh, I don't think they thought it would. I don't. Yeah, I, I must admit, I, I must stop with the conspiracy theories. I don't think they thought that it would turn out that way. But it's done pretty well for England. Sportsman from the West um, asks here: yeah, selection criteria. What is it, and how is it applied? It's very confusing when informed players are selected and not played, and out of form players are selected and played. Um, okay, a couple of points there. Just first of all, I think when a lot of times we think out of sight, out of mind. We have a lot of players in this current squad that play overseas, so we don't get to see them every week. So you might think a player is out of form where he's actually doing... Jasper Viss is a good point. He had an exceptional season for Leicester Tigers. Um, you know, there's players who've had injuries, like Andre Pollard who and Kurbis Reinach, who, who never got much game time. Elton Yankees is another point. There and we could have a whole video on Elton Yankees as well. Um, but yeah, there's some players who've, who, who've had injuries and haven't had much game time. So, And then there's the players that the fans think are out of form. A player like Vili Rue comes to mind, which who's definitely not out of form. And I think if anybody who watches the box closely would realise that Vili's probably involved in 90% of the Springbok tries. Uh, anything other than the line-out more, yeah, he's almost the last player to make the winning pass. So he's the guy who sees space. He arranges the back line. He arranges the attack. So he does a lot more than people give him credit for. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Vili. I know a lot of people think about knocked balls and things like that. And he does make, make mistakes. But I think he's really an exceptional attacker. And when you use him, when the box get to use him the right way, uh, the box back line fires. Um, so that's, that's the first point. The second point is... You know, you got to look at the team. They've won the World Cup. They've won the rugby, uh, well, sorry, not the rugby championship. They won the Lions series. And um, this management team has got to be given credit for knowing what they're doing. So while while people want to see new faces, I think the last year when everyone was going on about Apalele Fasi uh, coming into the side, uh, yeah, there wasn't much chance the year before. They hadn't played any rugby. Then they had to win a Lions series. So they kept it rather conservatively. So they haven't really had the opportunity to put a lot of new players in the team. That's tr- that's what they're trying to do this year. Maybe not according to everyone's liking. And there will be a bunch of SAA tests at the end of the year, which you'll see a lot of these players being played. You'll also see a lot of these players maybe coming into one of the Argentina tests as well. So uh, we, you will see them play there. So they are trying to bring in new faces, but um, yeah, the other thing point is you're not going to throw away a player that's got 50 or 100 tests just like that because I think if, if the Alistair Kutsia era showed us anything, and this this is not a dig at Alistair, this is a, um, a th- he was saddled with a policy where he couldn't pick players from overseas, is that when you put young players in with no experience, um, you have results that come against you, so and things can go horribly wrong very quickly. So um, I think uh, that's that's the one thing that you got to realize is that there is a, a form of continuity in a team. That you you don't just walk into a team, especially not the Springbok team. You're going to earn the jersey. So I think you know, fans are a lot of the time impatient, and sometimes rightly so. But I think the Springbok management team know what they're doing. Um, yeah, it's up to your player to knock on the door as hard as possible, and kick that door down. And I think there are players that are doing that, and they're getting rewarded this year. Um, Evan Riss, Elric Lowe, the guys like that, and you'll see a lot more of them in the future.
Guys, I'm going to, uh, we can go on for hours here if I take all the questions, but I'll come back and do another one of these soon. Um, but yeah, those are the answers to the questions. Please let me know what you think. You're welcome to leave questions below in the comments section or on the Twitter feed, and we'll try and do one of these again soon. Uh, I hope it helps. I hope it's enlightening for some people. Um, and yeah, and if you aren't subscribed already, please subscribe. Uh, trying to get this YouTube going and channel going and uh, yeah, trying to do a lot more of these rugby videos so yeah give it a give it a subscribe and the, they <laughs> they tell me i'm gonna say the notification bell then you get notifications when the videos come in but thanks a lot cheers and thanks for watching